Welcome to the forum by the Harvard School of Public Health. We're here to talk about gl global health and come up with a plan for the future, a new vision of global health in the future. My name is Abigail Trafford, and I'm an author and former health editor at the Washington Post, and I'm your moderator. I want to introduce our panelists first. Mark Dibel, who is executive director of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. And next to him is Julio Frank, whom we know, who is dean of Harvard School of the Public Health. And across the pond from Scotland is the Right Honorable Gordon Brown, MP, who is United Nations Special Envoy for Education. Uh, today's program is a collaboration between the Forum and Global Post. It's a live webcasting series, and it's produced at the Harvard School of Public Health. And very fittingly, we are celebrating our 100th anniversary this year. It's, uh, you can tweet us at, uh, at forum HP, HSPH and at, at Global Post. You can also send an email to the forum, one word, hsph.harvard.edu. For the next hour, we're going to explore all the issues, and we're going to come up with a blueprint for action. We're going to take questions from both all of you in the audience and also online. So I'd like to jump right into it, and I'm going to turn to you, Mark, really for a historical um, view. You know, we've made a great deal of success in global health. I mean, I look at your organization. Look what we've done for AIDS and tuberculosis and malaria. But you know, we're disappointed and frustrated, haven't met our millennium goals. A lot of people are totally left out. You can cure malaria, but then someone dies in childbirth. Um, what went wrong? Well, um, we should start with what went right, uh, because that's, uh, it's pretty remarkable where we are compared to 12 years ago, if you just look at uh, when the Millennium Development Goals were, were introduced. T tremendous progress on HIV, TB, and malaria, tremendous progress on education, tremendous pro progress on poverty. But, you know, to look for the future and where we can improve, I wouldn't say where we went wrong, I'd say where we're, we can evolve to, because this is all mm -hmm. an evolutionary phase, mm -hmm. uh, and things will continue to improve, is how we got to where we are today. And the reality is that the birth of development isn't the most um, uh, palatable thing. It was colonialism. Uh, where, where development started in Africa, Asia, Latin America was really out of colonialism. People wanted their workers to be just a little healthy, or their slaves. They wanted them to be just a little educated. Um, they needed roads to get the gold and silver moved around. Um, and that's where, that's where development started. Um, and then we went through different phases, you know, after World War I. A lot of people don't know that Herbert Hoover, he's remembered for the destruction of the, the world's economy. Uh, but he actually created the first large, mm -hmm. massive food program uh, to feed Europe after World War I. And then after World War II, uh, of course, the Marshall Plan helped rebuild in a development way. But um, it, we also had the Cold War. And so we moved from a colonialistic uh, and missionary, you know, there were missionaries involved at the beginning too, with some very good things, some humanitarian things, but some pretty bad things about. Um, uh, people being treated in different ways are seen as less than human. Um, so after that, we moved into basically a Cold War approach um, where it wasn't so important um, uh, what happened with money. You were basically trying to buy spheres of influence. Uh, and so that wasn't the best origin for where we wanted to get to. And the reality is institutions that are created during times are created with a culture and a structure that reflects the time. Um, and that needed to all change. Uh, you know, realistically, if you asked anyone 12 years ago what was happening in education, health, any issue of health, food, mm -hmm. the answer would have been we're spending X millions of dollars. It wouldn't have been we're trying to achieve this or that. It would have been we're spending X amount of money. Uh, and the reality is if you're, you're um, trying to win influence, you don't really care what happens um, um, with your money. And if you're living in post-colonial guilt, you don't really care about what happens with your money uh, because all you're trying to do is make yourself feel better. So you're not really looking for outcomes. You're trying to make yourself feel better or you're trying to make people feel better about you um, by buying them off, basically. So then... Something historic happened in the year 2002, um, if I remember, no, three, the Monterey Consensus, which Julio was down in Mexico during that. 
And that actually looked backwards and said, you know, we made a lot of progress, a lot of things have happened, but what do we need to do to change? And there really, it was, remar it was a revolutionary historic mm -hmm. genetic shift. In the past, really, we just kind of moved along. Institutions got mm -hmm. created. They responded to emergencies. But it, people stopped and said, what do we really need mm -hmm. to do? And what, the, what came out of that, it's very short. It's only a couple pages, actually, the Monterey Consensus. And, and what it said was there are five major principles. One is shared responsibility and mutual mm -hmm. accountability. So we needed to move past the paternalism of colonialism and post-colonial guilt, uh, where we're the saviors coming in to do things for people, to a real partnership, a shared responsibility, a mutual accountability, uh, where everyone needs to be involved and people need to be held responsible, both those who provide resources uh, and those who use mm -hmm. the resources. And we need to see each other as partners in a two-way relationship, not a one-way relationship. Uh, and that's called country ownership, which is a pretty unattractive word for really shared responsibility mm -hmm. and mutual accountability. The second was if you're going to achieve that, um, you need to have a results-based approach, not a money-based approach. Uh, how, not, not how much money do you spend, but what, what results are you going to get. The third is good governance. Uh, and people immediately jump to corruption, but that's not what good governance is. Good governance is using the money well to get results. And part of that is don't steal the money, but part of it is use the money well. It's true in this country, it's true in the United Kingdom, as, as, as true as it is in other places. And the last is really fundamentally important, which is all sectors need to be involved. So in the past, it was always public to pub public sector to public sector, government to government. And one of the great insights of the Monterey Consensus is it's really people to people. All sectors, the private sector, non-governmental sector, academic sector, everyone mm -hmm. needs to be involved if we're going to have development. The final piece was economic growth is going to fuel true development, what we're doing in the midterm or some, some other things. So if you take that, and of course I'm kind of um, sweeping over 200 years with, with big assumptions, but that's generally the arc that we've seen. The opportunity now is to take those fundamental principles, which led to things like the Global Fund. Our, we were structured based on that culture. We weren't 21st century culture. We weren't based on the assumptions and culture of the past when many of the other organizations were created. And that gives you a lot more flexibility, a lot more opportunity. The Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations was created in that way. And so the real opportunity is to have 21st century institutions to implement 21st century ideals and ideas rather than trying to cram 21st century ideas into 20th or even 19th century institutions. And that's really hard because culture and structure is really tough to overcome and change. So we have this remarkable opportunity to look at things in a new way, an exciting way that began with the Monterey Consensus, moved forward, and we're really fortunate to be with two leaders. You know, Julio did most of this in Mexico. He actually implemented it all. And Gordon, as prime minister, was one of the, one of the few leaders in the world that really got this and has been pushing this forward. So it's a real privilege to be with the two of them because we wouldn't be doing or having this conversation without the work they've done. But what about the practice of siloing? that we seem to have programs uh, aimed at specific diseases, which is not a, doesn't, doesn't bring in all the other aspects of health. Um, what, what about that practice and what have been some of the consequences? Well, again, if we go back to 12 years ago, look where we were. Everyone was just looking at how much money you spent, not results you mm -hmm. got. And from a taxpayer perspective or people uh, like Gordon Brown who had to decide what you do with taxpayer money, if you don't have any results, how are you going to convince people you ought to spend money on it? I mean, we kind of, that all started on Ravel. And literally, you would see examples of a, a, of a development agency committing $50,000 in a country mm -hmm. and saying that they, they could take credit for everything that was happening in that country. That was nuts. So there had to be a moment at which there was a massive investment in something that showed results. And that's how the Global Fund was created. That's how the US President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief was cre created, the President's Malaria Initiative, the Millennium Challenge Corporation. These were institutions that were created to move and respond to a new approach to development, including results. So we had to show that you could invest billions of dollars. And PEPFAR is a great example. I mean, $15 billion that was President Bush uh, thought of and created. The Congress, in a bipartisan way, adopted. And it's been bipartisan from the beginning. President Obama has carried it forward in a very exciting way um, with great leadership. So it's very bipartisan, but we had to show that a massive investment of billions of dollars would lead to results. And that would be hard to do if you're doing everything. Now we can look differently. Um, you know, you have to take steps. It's evolution. It's not that was bad, this is good. It's what happened and why and where are we going. Now we can look at the health of people. 
and say, how are we going to keep a person healthy? Uh, so if you save someone's life from HIV, a mother's life from HIV by treating her, but she dies in childbirth, the child's no better off, she's no better off, the family's no better off, the community's no better off. So how do we look at health more holistically? And again, I think that's something um, that these two gentlemen have thought about and done a lot on. And then I think Gordon will talk about, and what about a step further? Yeah, let me, let me now turn to you, uh, um, Gordon Brown. Uh, we all know the triangle, the, the critical triangle of health, education, and development. But tell us a little bit about your work in the education field. Well, let, let me first of all congratulate uh, Harvard School of Public Health on celebrating its uh, centenary, uh, a great achievement. Uh, we have many ancient institutions uh, here in uh, Britain, and we sometimes say that the first, the first hundred years uh, of any institution's history are always the most difficult. So we wish uh, uh, Harvard well for the future. I'm also privileged to be uh, on a platform, so to speak, even though it's virtual, with, uh, with Mark and uh, Julio. Uh, these guys have done an enormous amount, and their writing is, I think, the most uh, stimulating, the most far-reaching in its um, implications of any writing that is done on health at the moment. So it, it's a great privilege to be with them. I'm very surprised you've chosen a politician to add to the two uh, experts. Um, the last time I spoke to a forum, uh, someone quoted the definition of a politician as being uh, someone who's lost the art of communication, but not, alas, the gift of speech. <laughs> so I will continue, I will continue to uh, give my views, but I, but I do understand that I'm talking uh, with uh, two great experts. Look, look, it's been a golden age uh, for health in, in, in the sense that Mark has described it, huge additional resources, uh, more so than, uh, for example, education, which I'll come on to. Uh, great um, institutional advances, a great philanthropic activity as well uh, with uh, Bill Gates uh, and, and, of course, the creation of the Global Fund, which Mark now uh, runs. So this has been a, a, an innovative decade, and we've reduced infant mortality very substantially, uh, and there have been major advances in the treatment of the, the terrible uh, life-threatening diseases, polio, AIDS, tuberculosis, uh, major advances made. But what do we learn at the end of this uh, decade, particularly in a context where there is more questioning about the use of resources. I think the first thing we learn is that we have to think of the individual as a whole, uh, that too many of the initiatives were disease specific, uh, too little was done to build the capacity of healthcare system. And so while anybody who's in the medical field knows that you're dealing with chronic and acute uh, diseases, not enough attention perhaps was on the everyday work of building healthcare systems, uh, of training nurses, uh, training uh, doctors, training health uh, workers generally. Uh, that leads to two conclusions on, on my part. One is that um, we've got to think of education and health together, and, and Mark really prefixed these remarks that I was going to make. If you take girls' education, if you educate a girl, as I think Mark was uh, implying, then that is almost the best chance you have of avoiding uh, early pregnancies, of avoiding all the difficulties associated with them, of avoiding the contraction of uh, HIV, of avoiding a whole series of other uh, problems that arise in ill health. Uh, and the failure to advance girls' education for millions of children has been a major problem that I think uh, is causing difficulties in every field, employment, but also in, in health. Uh, and if we look at the statistics in sub-Saharan Africa, the chances of an uneducated girl uh, dying in childbirth are twice as high, twice as high uh, as the chances of an educated girl surviving uh, uh, childbirth. So these are important statistics that I think we've got to be borne in mind. And we need programs, and I've talked to Mark about this, that look at um, education and health together and look at the importance of education for all being perhaps one of the best ways that we can achieve health for all. I think the second aspect of this is what I've mentioned, and that is that we have disease-specific uh, programs and we haven't looked at capacity as a whole. I met the president of Sierra Leone a few months ago. Uh, they have only 100 doctors uh, for a country, I think, of more than 7 million people, 100 doctors trained every year. Uh, they have 100 uh, nurses uh, and about the same number of midwives. Uh, many of them are lost to the system because they can get better salaries going abroad. Uh, but the shortage of capacity in healthcare systems in the countries that are most uh, vulnerable 
is something we've got to deal with. Can I briefly say what the other points I think we should uh, talk about? One is innovative financing, huge advances made in health about the use of resources. And Mark mentioned people are not any longer interested in just in the inputs, it is about the outputs. We need to look again at how we can use resources better. I think some of the new proposals that are coming, for example, the Health Impact Fund, I think it's Professor Porgy has put this forward, these are worth looking at. Uh, and I know myself that uh, the way we use resources has got to be rethought. And Helio and uh, Mark have suggested that if we could coordinate the use of resources more effectively at a global level, then perhaps we could get four or five times greater value from the money we're actually spending at the moment. And that raises my final point for the start of this. The weakness of international cooperation. While there has been huge advances, I think we can genuinely conclude that there has been a stalling in the last few years in international cooperation on the big issues. It's true of the economy, it's true of finance, it's true of uh, the coordination of the effort on the environment, where the climate change talks failed, obviously, but it is also true on health and, and education, and in particular, if I look at health, why are we not more effective in bringing together the health professionals, the governments, the international organisations, and the private sector, and the voluntary organisations and foundations that are, that are involved in health? Perhaps we need to give the Global Fund more powers and more scope uh, to go further. Perhaps we need better relationships between the WHO and the other institutions that exist. Perhaps national governments have got to combine their efforts more effectively instead of focusing too much on bilateral aid. But what I feel uh, we need to talk about today is how we can more effectively coordinate the use of resources by greater cooperation between all those people who are in the global health uh, field. And if we were to do that, then I'm absolutely sure that with the same amount of resources, uh, hopefully more, but even with the same amount of resources, we could achieve four or five times as much in the global health field. Uh, thank you. And I'm going to turn to you, Julio. This is a good segue. You talk about a diagonal system. Uh, what is that? And give us some examples of that. Sure. Well, first of all, uh, let me say that uh, in the context of our centennial, it is truly uh, an honor to to welcome here uh, to the forum uh, Gordon Brown and Mark Dybel. Uh, we're, we're really delighted that, uh, that you could participate in, in this <coughs> special centennial forum uh, to look at the future of global health. Um, I, I think uh, both Mark and Gordon have clearly uh, outlined the challenge we have. There is a tension between uh, the focus on results, which calls for you know, very specific targets, uh, and I do think the MDGs were an, an incredible step forward in terms of uh, getting every country in the world to agree on a set of common goals and targets and to have a system of uh, regular reporting. I mean, this is unprecedented in the history of international uh, relations, to have every country in the world hold itself accountable to its own people and to the rest of the global community for a common set of limited, specific, and time-bound uh, goals. So I think, um, you know, whatever we discuss about the content of the MDGs, it's the fact that it created this unprecedented mechanism for mutual accountability that I think is it's of its, uh, it, its greatest uh, value. Now, there was that pressure to focus on specific, um, in the case of health, specific diseases. Uh, and where we run into the limit of that is, first of all, the fact that People do get sick of multiple things, but especially that those disease-specific targets do not take into account the consequences of success, the dynamic of health, which is such that we are always victims of our own success. So we've had this ongoing debate between so-called vertical approaches that focus on specific diseases with the advantages that it's highly measurable and, and results-oriented versus the horizontal school of thought which says, no, no, what we need to do is strengthen health systems, strengthen the delivery platforms generically, and they will figure out what to deal with without a clear sense of priorities. The problem with the horizontal approach is that every time you just strengthen health systems without a clear sense of priorities, typically those health systems end up catering to the needs of the better off or the powerful. So uh, my colleague Jaime Sepulveda extended that geometric analogy and say, well, it's not vertical, this is specific, it's not horizontal, strengthening without priorities. It's a diagonal approach. 
And the diagonal approach, what it means, is that do you do use specific priorities to drive improvements that then build the capacity to deal with other issues, including with the consequences of success. Because, you know, if we're successful in reducing maternal mortality, the same women who would have died in childbirth are exactly the same women that will now live long enough to develop cervical cancer or breast cancer. And by a diagonal approach, you don't have the work done by dealing only with the specific target. You uh, use those clear priorities to drive improvements that are there to face the next set of, of, uh, of uh, priorities. The other sense of the diagonal is what Gordon Brown was uh, alluding to. The understanding that health is not a silo or a specific sector of public action, whether uh, public responsibility, whether it's locally or globally, but that health must be thought of as, a, as an objective, a social objective, to which, for, which, for the pursuit of which we have to mobilize all the tools of public policy. He just gave the example. Education is a fundamental investment to improve health. If we think of health not as the objective of the health system, but as a social objective that's broadly shared. And I think that's the other way of thinking diagonally, which is across sectors. And to think in the global level of not just global health governance, but global governance for health. How do we talk about health as an objective and not as a sector? Is there any examples of a programs or a country that is far along in this more holistic diagonal approach? Well, if, if, uh, there's many, many examples. Obviously, the example I know best is my own country, uh, where we explicitly use, when we, when we realized there were half of the population, 50 million people who were uninsured, uh, and we needed to get legislation to uh, have a vast uh, expansion of public investment in health so that we could now cover 50 million uninsured people, it was very important to convey a clear sense of deliverables. And, uh, and we explicitly used a diagonal approach where there were a number of priorities. For example, reducing maternal mortality was a top priority. And that approach drove the general improvements in the delivery platforms. You needed to have you know, places for women to go to deliver. You needed to have blood supply for uh, uh, obstetric emergencies. You need to have outreach community workers to detect. And um, I think the, the, the Global Fund and the work that Mark has done is a great example of how the work with AIDS or PEPFAR, your previous um, legacy of using the, those platforms, in this case around AIDS, to then uh, 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 use them for, for uh, expanding other sets of interventions as we become successful in the initial targets. Mark, some thoughts. Well, I, I, to build on what Julio said, you know, if your goal is to build a health system, that's what you're going to do. Uh, you're going to, and what will your indicators be? How many doctors do you have? How many nurses do you have? How many hospitals do you have? That's not the goal of health or a health system. The goal of health is healthier people. So if your goal is building a health system, you can have a great health system and have minimal impact on health. So if you start with a goal, as Julio said, of healthy people, um, you then start building what's necessary for healthy people. And you start linking health to other sectors like education. I mean, there, there is this wonderful moment in the post-millennium development goals to really look at women and girls. And what do women and girls need? Well, they need education and they need health. Uh, and then what does that impact? Well, it impacts economic growth. And we actually have pretty good data on that. And it actually may have a pretty big impact on democracy because women are actually much nicer uh, and work <laughs> together much better than men do. Um, and so, you know, we start to look at how do we create the societies we want, the, the global environment that we want, and then how do p pieces fit into it rather than starting from either, you know, the lowest common denominator of a health system or starting with a specific goal uh, that dis is dissected from everything else and start looking at things in a most more holistic way. Now, that's easy to say. You then actually mm -hmm. have to invest in a way that leads to those outcomes. But it's all about goal setting. You know, what do you want? And then you can figure out how to do it. And that's really been the problem for the last hundred years. And that's why, you know, if you're looking forward, it's always good to look backwards and see where you came from. And in the past, we really have just built stuff at, individually when a need arose. We created a new institution for children. We created a new institution for family planning. We created, well, that's not a very healthy way to do it. 
Um, now, you also can't have a grand architect sitting around putting all the pieces together because it's more, the world's more complicated than that. But I do think that we're in a new place. And I don't, you cannot underestimate the leadership of the last, the political leadership of the last 10 years from people like Gordon um, uh, and the political leaders during that time, uh, Tony Blair, uh, George Bush. Now we have, you know, C David Cameron committing to 0.7% for the United Kingdom, uh, which is pretty remarkable. You have President Hollande, in, despite the difficult times, um, maintaining their commitments. There's a new, that political leadership of the last 10 years is what we need. We talk about health and education as if, you know, we can all do it. We actually can't. It takes remarkable political leadership. If it's not a political priority, none of this is going to happen. So to make all this happen, we need leaders and people like Gordon to be le taking this forward. Uh, otherwise, we're going to get stuck in our own little world. Well, uh, Gordon, you are working on, uh, you know, a vision for 2025. Uh, give us some of your thoughts picking up on what Mark said. First thing that I would want to introduce into this, this discussion is uh, a consideration of issues of inequality. Uh, and I think we must not miss this when we're looking at the next set of Millennium Development Goals. Because the danger has been over these last few years that while we are committed to universal targets, that we miss out on the bottom 10% or the bottom 5% or the bottom 15%. Certainly it's true. education is true also in many areas of health. And you end up with a situation where we're always rightly trying to raise the ceiling. So we're trying to build for the future with quality targets, targets for doing better in every area. But we have not yet built the floor. And I think there has got to be some consideration as we finish this process of the first set of Millennium Development Goals about those who've missed out, those who've been left out, those who are left behind almost entirely. And as Yulia was suggesting, uh, they're almost uh, usually the same people in health as they are in education. So the illiterate is the person most vulnerable to disease, is the person who's least likely to have a job, is the person who's most likely to die early, and is the person whose children are most likely to be susceptible to uh, themselves having uh, diseases and conditions. So. I do think there is uh, a danger, and I just want to inject this into this conversation as we look to the future of setting Millennium Development Goals that are rightly more ambitious about the future and rightly demand higher ceilings, uh, but because our targets are, are, are sort of uh, almost built on averages, we need, to, we need to make sure that we don't miss out on a, a generation of people. And if you take the case of girls, for example, 32 million girls not at school, 500 million girls who will never complete their education uh, under the current uh, circumstances. And of course, uh, still very high levels of maternal mortality amongst uh, young uh, teenage uh, girls, uh, still high levels of infant mortality as a result of uh, uh, their failure to uh, be in a position to take care of the children or to be healthy when their child is born. So uh, let's not forget uh, the goals of, of, of dealing with some of these great inequities. And I think a great deal more thinking has got to be done uh, as to whether you look at income inequalities or simply at health inequalities and education inequalities, which we, which we uh, tend to do. Uh, as far as thinking forward to, to 2025, I mean, I'm uh, obviously fascinated by the advance of technology and what it can do. But I'm also fascinated by the ability to do such more with technology and yet the inequality of access to it. So again, there is a question of equity that has got to be addressed when we're looking at the future of both healthcare and generally the Millennium uh, Development Goals. We have within our grasp uh, far greater technological advance than we've ever seen before. In fact, those people who say that technological advance is going to halt will be proved completely wrong because I see even greater speed of technological advance benefiting healthcare in the years to come. But again, I just raise this uh, issue that I think we've got to address, that the access to this new technology is unequal. So 25% of the diseases of the world, uh, the conditions of uh, bad health in the world, are in Africa. Only 3% of the money that is spelt, spent in the world on health is spent in Africa. And only 1% of the health employees of the world are in Africa. And that is a figure or a set of figures that I think sums up this challenge. Uh, that we need to have equity at the centre of our considerations as well as 
the general issues that are so important that have just been addressed of getting the right results, using the money effectively and having very clear goals in other areas as well. Thank you. I think, I think here's a moment we're going to turn it over to you, the audience, and take some questions. I just want to point out also that the forum had a special forum on girls in education several months ago. So questions from the audience. Yes. Please state your name and then your question. Good morning. I'm John McDonough. I'm with the uh, Department of Health Policy and Management. I'd like to ask you if you could expand on your reference to the private sector and their role in this. On the one hand, we see global corporations as the source of tobacco and tobacco-related disease and poor diets and leading to chronic disease. On the other hand, we see global corporations embracing new forms of corporate social responsibility. We see them embracing population health improvement as part of their missions. And I'm wondering if you have any ideas about the appropriate and valuable role that the corporate sector can play and how they should be involved in achieving these goals. You, why don't you go, Mark? So, um, you know, part of the Monterey consensus um, view was that private sector was one of the key players that needed to engage, and that in the end, economic growth was going to drive uh, real health uh, and development. Um, uh, and if you look at um, where we are today compared to then, that was anathema. Uh, before the Monterey consensus. There's still massive battles being fought on that. You know, should the private sector be involved? Is there conflict of interest? The reality is that health, education, development are essential for private sector growth. Uh, and that, that's begun to be recognized by the sector. So there's a huge shift in corporate social responsibility away from, we'll create a little foundation over here, and we'll send some money over there, and we'll give little grants to, we need healthy, educated people in the environments we work in, or we're not going to survive, uh, both for productivity, but also for marketplace. You have to have healthy, educated, uh, growing economies in order to have healthy people. So the private sector plays a role in many ways. One is by providing those services directly to their employees or in the community. Uh, one is financially. We have the, the Global Fund is actually a public-private partnership, and we have uh, significant contributions to the Global Fund from the private sector uh, through something called Product Red, through groups like Chevron. Uh, but a very important piece is the core competencies of the private sector. A great example of, you know, instead of looking at big pictures starting to look more refined, one of the things you need for a functioning health system is supply chains. And supply chains are actually very complicated in uh, a lot of parts of the world. So we're working with Coca-Cola uh, to, to help build supply chains, to support governments and countries to build a supply chain. Who better than Coca-Cola to work on a supply chain? Uh, so we need that core competency. And one of the biggest challenges in health, education, and everything is management, uh, financial management, human resource management. Public sector institutions, including universities, are not particularly good at this stuff. The private sector lives or dies on it. Uh, and so we're trying to build partnerships that draw core competencies and all of us working together. And it's really got to be driven from the local environment, too. I mean, we tend to think about multilaterals and going after them. It's the companies in the, in the countries that for whom this is key uh, and who really engage. And so our, we are focusing more and more on the private sector in country because that's where the health, education, and development of people really matter. Um, I think now we want to turn this part of the forum to, uh, OK, wh how do we implement this grand new vision? And I guess I have to throw out, uh, again, to you, Mark, like, who's going to be the leadership? What, what happens to the World Health Organization? What could and should the World Health Organization do? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting way to start. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit like saying, what's the big picture, and then going straight to a goal. So I'd rather put the World Health Organization in a bigger context, which is right. how do we get to, uh, uh, we call it global health architecture, which is pretty boring. We're great about taking big vision ideas and putting words on. What is global health on. architecture? It's, it's meaningless. It's how you put things <laughs> together. It's, you know, it's, how you, it's basically how you would fit a bunch of things together in a way that makes more sense, uh, architecture, building something. Um, and what it really takes go, it comes, is political leadership. So l let's just take the Global Fund as an example. When the Global Fund was created, every agency in the world, bilateral and UN, wanted, didn't want it to exist uh, because it was a threat. It was a competition. And it was the leadership of uh, Kofi Annan and uh, President Obasanjo from Nigeria that basically just rolled over all the hurdles 
and you need that political push. No minister of health, no NGO, no private Bill Gates, no one's going to be able to do that. You need the political leadership, and that's why I have repeatedly mentioned the political leadership that was necessary. But we're shifting. The political leadership for the last 10 years has largely come from the G8, from high-income countries. Looking forward, we need that leadership mm -hmm. to be coming from a much broader sector. Uh, we're talking a lot about the G20 emerging powers and their unique role in the world today. You know, they were, in the old paternalistic jargon, recipients in the old donor-recipient relationship, which is terrible jargon. Uh, one thing we have to do is get past the terrible language of development, just those words. Mm -hmm. If you're living in Africa or Mexico or Turkey, how, how would you like to be said that you're a recipient or you're being helped or you're being aided? It's a partnership. It's not a donor recipient. It's a partnership. So we've got to get past the language. But we need the engagement of the countries that have emerged from low income country status, from poor health, from poor development, to actually being able to provide. That's where the leadership really needs to shift to in a broader sense. And so what we've called for is bringing the political leaders from across countries at different income levels to say, what do we need to look like? And we're saying it should be like the Bretton Woods conference. We don't want, this is not an economics thing like Bretton Woods was and it gets people kind of messed up. But if you think about where we were when Bretton Woods came to be, the world was a mess. You know, the economic architecture, the structures, the institutions had failed and they weren't fit for purpose to get mm -hmm. us from where we were to where we need to be. And that's what we're saying, that we're not fit for purpose right now. We have too many organizations mm -hmm. spread all over the place uh, that have multiple, each institution with multiple functions. We fall all over ourselves. The countries have to deal with you know, 30, 40 institutions in health. Multiply that by all the different parts of development. It's, a, it's an absolute mess. And the real risk is they're going to start creating themselves like we are in all these different silos to respond to that rather than creating what they want, which is a comprehensive approach that looks at advancing the health and development of their people. So what we're saying is we should have something like Bretton Woods, that type of big think where people come together and say, what do we need? What do we actually need if our goal is mm -hmm. a healthier, more prosperous world uh, uh, where people can be happy and fulfill their full potential? Um, across the development spectrum, including health. And that, to me, is, or to us, is what we put forward as, as a way forward. But it can't be what it was before. It can't be just the GA. It can't be just the high-income countries. It has to be everyone coming together to see how we put things together. Now, the World Health Organization is an essential piece of that. One of the things we all think is necessary is a normative, standard-setting, accountability organization. And that's what the World Health Organization mm -hmm. was set up to do. They were not set up to do implementation. They were not set up to do procurement. They were not set up to do program. And they also provide technical support. So a general framework would be to have people who finance health, which is what the Global Fund does. We're a financial institution. A group that provides technical support, whether it's current bilaterals in the UN family, whether it's South to South, what we call South to South partnership on technical issues. Uh, so you need a, some financing groups. You need technical support groups. You need normative groups, something that's going to set standards. And you need someone who's going to do the advocacy and push around and the accountability. So if that's what we need, then why don't we set about creating that right. and, and, and fixing where we are today? But that's going to require a lot of work and a lot of broken China. But we can do it now. We have the opportunity to do it. And I think the reason we have the opportunity is because of the emerging powers uh, and because the countries have had it with the, what we've given them, basically. They're not going to put up with what we, we created anymore. And they're increasing their own economic growth. They're increasing their own contributions. This year, uh, low- and middle-income countries are providing more money for HIV-AIDS than the, the so-called donors. Uh, over time, that's going to grow, and the proportion of health uh, and development being provided by the countries themselves will ex far exceed what is being provided externally. So if we don't get our act together soon, uh, we're not going to be necessary. Uh, but we can add a lot as a global community. So I think if we, if we look at the world differently, if we see where we came from and where we need to get to, if we all sit down and say, how would we actually put this together, we can do it in a way that would be exciting, contribute to this broader vision, and really be a genetic jump which is what the Monterey consensus was, which is what happened over the last 10 years has been. But the next genetic jump is to say, we've gotten as far as we can the way we're doing it. 
Let's stop and see where we need to get to. And again, we cannot get to where we need to go in the current environment. We cannot continue to cram these 21st century ideas through 20th and 19th century institutions. It won't work. So the challenge to us is, are we going to pick this up, uh, or are we going to just become irrelevant? Now, Gordon, how do we get, how do we make this genetic jump? How do we get from, well, yeah. Mark is absolutely right. Uh, the, um, when we created the G20 in 2008 and nine to deal with the financial crisis, it demanded a few people who were determined uh, to push things forward. And I would just add to what Mark says, I think you do need to involve the private sector and the foundations, as well as governments of emerging markets, developing the developing world and the advanced economies. And I think it's bringing them all together, private and public, that is going to be the key uh, to the future. I I've just actually come back from China, where I was meeting the president and the premier. And one of the things I was pressing on them is that it was for China now to contribute to education. It's one of the few countries, actually, that I got to before Mark got to them to ask for money for help. So <laughs> I, was, uh, I, I was quite fortunate. Uh, so China has got to be involved. Korea is now far more involved. The other BRIC countries, Brazil and, of course, uh, Russia, uh, which has not done as much as it should have been uh, doing in, in, in recent years, uh, and then some of the, uh, the, the other emerging countries, Mexico, Turkey, Indonesia, India, they should be ready to do more. So Mark is absolutely right on that. The, the other thing that I think comes out of this uh, coordinated uh, process is we have got to continue to look at better ways of innovating in finance. And I mentioned this earlier, but I use the example of uh, Gavi on vaccination and the IFIM facility that we were able to create a few years ago. And we managed by bringing the public and private sector together by getting one or two governments, but not many, but one or two governments to support it, to raise four billion extra for, for, for vaccination from the private sector, which is money, of course, that is being paid back over a 20 year period through the willingness of governments uh, to fund uh, these, uh, these uh, projects over a continuing budget uh, period. So. There are many ways, I think, if you can bring governments, the private sector, the financial sector together, we could do more more quickly. Uh, and I think it's right that what we need is one or two leaders. Look, if I was in power at the moment, I would be calling such a meeting. Ban Ki-moon could call such a meeting as the Secretary General of the United Nations and maybe encouraged to do so. But there are one or two countries that Mark and uh, Julio know are leading on health who are in a position at the moment to take this uh, initiative and, and move things forward. But bring in the private sector, bring in the foundations, of course, the foundations are incredibly important to health as well as the governments and the international institutions, and look at this holistically again so that we can have a more effective coordination of private and public resources. And to, in, 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 to conclude, the, the last question was about the private sector contribution. Uh, I'm impressed by the amount of companies that are wanting to be involved in global health and we should maximize that involvement by bringing them to the, to the table in a, in, a, in a positive and coordinated way. Julio, why don't you speak to this? Sure. Um, I mean, one of the um, side effects of this golden era of, gold, of global health was that with the expansion of funding, very mind, you know, international financing for health went from $5 billion in 1990 to close to $30 billion by 2012. It's an era of enormous growth. Well, the expression of that was an expanded pluralism. And from the days when we had WHO and UNICEF and maybe a few of the, of the multilateral development banks like the World Bank, today there are 175 entities, public, private, voluntary, that are active in global health. Some of them have been hugely innovative in terms of governance, like the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria, like the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, but we now have a, high, a, a, a very pluralistic, uh, 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 what I would call a global health system. And we, I think what we need to do is think of a global health system, not just uh, the sum of national health systems, but there is a global reality of actors that are interacting in, in very complex ways. And there are not just the health specialized entities, but all the entities that have an influence on health. Now, I, the way I, I, I think we need to move forward is to think exactly around functions. And that's the way I try to think in general about health systems, whether it's national health systems or global health system, or the global health system. And to my mind, there are four functions 
that need to be performed. And I think Mark was already hinting to that functional view rather than the uh, structural bureaucratic view. But there are four key functions. <clears throat> the first is the production of uh, global public goods, knowledge-related global public goods, like research, like comparative analysis, like uh, uh, standards such as the international classification of disease. It is paradoxical that w in this era of huge expansion of funding, some of those functions are being starved. And you know, if we didn't have the international classification of disease, nothing else that we do would happen. And yet there's no movement for the international classification. These are public goods that are being underfunded even when we have this expansion of funding for specific programs. <coughs> that first function, I think, is crucial. The second is the management of externalities among countries. And that involves surveillance and coordination because you know every time there's an outbreak in one country, it affects other countries. And that needs to be managed at the global level. It's an example of interdependence that needs to be managed. And that no country, no matter how powerful, can deal with alone. The third, is the, the third function is the mobilization of global solidarity. And that in turn includes I international aid financing, technical cooperation. It also includes serving as an agency for the dispossessed, for people in countries whose governments are the violators of their human rights. That's been the function we've tended to emphasize, and correctly so. But it is only one of four. And the fourth is stewardship. And that involves and includes coordination, you know, this convening power for something like a Bretton Woods uh, conference, but it also includes the intersectorial advocacy. How do we make sure that the agencies that are dealing with education or with intellectual property or with trade rules see health as an objective? And to me, we need to reconfigure the, the, the global system on the basis of the functions, because what we now have is uh, overlap and multiplicity and some of the functions, particularly in international cooperation, and a neglect of other functions, particularly the production of global public goods, like uh, norms, uh, and the stewardship function, which should be the fundamental functions of the WHO. Let's, uh, <coughs> le let's turn this open. What are, are there some questions here in the audience or online? Yes, right here. Good morning. My name is Lily Muldoon. I'm a MPH candidate here in the Global Health and Populations Department. And thank you for engaging us in this robust conversation. And my question relates to um, post-2015, which is quickly approaching. And I'm sure we're going to do a critical analysis of our successes with the MDGs and also analysis of, unfortunately, the ones we haven't achieved. And looking beyond that, there's been many proposals about what to prioritize next. For example, out of the um, Rio summit in 2012, they suggest the sustainable development goals, um, promoting more of um, addressing climate change and um, having health be critically linked to those types of policies. And then we also have proposals such as Gordon Brown suggests to think more about inequality or the diagonal health infrastructures. So my question is, how should you and how should we as global health leaders reconcile these different frameworks and different proposals going forward? Mark, why do you want to take that? Muldoon sounds like a Scottish name. Maybe Gordon, maybe Gordon should take it. <laughs> uh, yes. okay. I, I, can, I don't want to put him on the spot. I can start. Uh, you know, uh, go ahead, Gordon. Go ahead, Gordon. Every name is originally Scottish. <laughs> the, 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 uh, I, I think this is a, a central question that is going to be addressed, of course, over the next year as we complete this work on the post-2015 uh, goals. The first thing I would say is let us not lose sight of the fact that we haven't met many of the existing goals. and that We must not allow the debate about the future to divert attention from the necessity of moving quickly to meet the goals that we set in the past. And that's true in health. It's also true, as, 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 I, as you would expect me to say, in education. The, 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 second, the, sec the second thing is that it is right to bring together the uh, environmental objectives uh, uh, with the income, health, education, and welfare objectives. Uh, and we must find a set of goals that are achievable uh, and 
can be expressed in ways that people can understand. And we must find a way that although it was mentioned at the beginning that national governments have responded to the Millennium Development Goals, many of them feel under no obligation to deliver them and are certainly under no constitutional or political uh, direct responsibility to deliver them. So let us find a way when we finish this work of trying to bind in those governments that have got a responsibility because they have some of the greatest problems uh, to taking action most quickly. So one of the failures of the MDGs was in the ability to uh, tie uh, the particular governments where the problems were greatest uh, to the delivery of these objectives in any uh, meaningful uh, meaningful way. Uh, the third the third thing I, I would say is that quality uh, must be important to the, to the next set of goals. Uh, we had uh, crude targets in a sense, and that was inevitable. Uh, but you know, in education, you don't want just everybody to be at school. You want people to be getting a quality education in healthcare. You don't want everybody just to be able to be treated. You want them to have quality. Uh, quality health care as well as uh, having good doctors and, and, and everything else. So I think the debate over the next year has got to focus, one, on making sure we meet, meet the existing goals, secondly, incorporating these other objectives, but in a meaningful way, in, in where you can express it in policy uh, objectives that can be achieved and are not too abstract, uh, and, and of course, uh, as I said before, we want to find a way to tie governments in. And I, I would just repeat, and I know I'm repeating myself from what I said earlier, there must be a way of ensuring that as we raise the ceiling, we do complete that floor by dealing with that group of people that concern me most, who have been left out completely uh, when we have failed to reach some of our targets and may continue to fail unless they become a greater priority than they are now. If I, could, if I could just add to that, um, you know, one of Gordon's points was we need something that policymakers and people can rally around. And, you know, with the, with the availability of social networking and what's necessary to push governments to take responsibility, because this is about people. And, and I was talking with Richard Curtis, uh, who started uh, Comic Relief in the UK. Some of you may know he's a famous director. He said the only term worse than Millennium Development Goals is Sustainable Development Goals. I mean, what, yes. what does that mean? At least Millennium had the word Millennium in it, and it sounded exciting. Um, so we should come up with something that makes a little more sense than wonky things that we might all talk about in academia or in policy circles. But if you're trying to get people excited about it, Sustainable Development Goals is probably not going to do it. Um, uh, which is, you know, kind of tongue in cheek, but not really, because we have to think about how we move the world uh, towards something, uh, towards a new vision, and you're not going to do it with wonky slogans like that. Um, but you know, there's not competition between the different vantage points. They're all getting at the same thing, which is how do we have a more prosperous, healthier, educated world that works together in a different way. Climate is part of that, but certainly everything else, the current Millennium Development Goals are part of that. I think Gordon's point on, and what we're trying to say is how do you put all that together in a way that allows countries and the people in countries and the world to move us in a new direction that's not confined to individual approaches, but we can't lose sight of the things that need to be done in order to achieve those, those objectives. So it, it's, it's an exciting moment um, that will lead to dramatic change if we allow it to, and we don't get bogged down into how is this different than that and what's the priority over this, but how do we create a better world and what are the, if that's our goal, what are the structures that need to be in place to allow us to move in that direction? Uh, another question. Oh, you have a question here. Yes, we have a lot of questions coming in online, so I just want to share some of them. How do you see the incorporation of evidence-based research and policy making? Would you say there is a need for more networking between networks, which include policymakers, to bridge the science policy interface? And any ideas on how this can be improved? I, I would just say um, that that first function of making sure we produce the knowledge-related global public goods includes that translation so that knowledge informs policy. But that's exactly where we need to invest, not just in producing the programs, but actually evaluating and building a body of evidence of what works and what doesn't work, and what might be adequately transferred across borders. This is, uh, we know that knowledge was a big driver of health improvement since the Second World War. How do we maintain that? But that's exactly one of the functions that I see being uh, perilously neglected 
in the uh, discussions about priorities moving forward. Good. Another question. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for, for speaking with us all. My name is Bill Bean. I'm in Global Health. Um, Bean is originally a Scottish name, sir. So um, it's changed over the years. Um, what I'd like to know is to take this down from a very, you know, 30,000 foot level, global players, lots and lots of money, and speaking to students directly. Um, what do students need to do today uh, at, st at institutions like the School of Public Health here, um, other institutions around the world, in order to move the agenda forward? Because I think that's critical. I think that's what we're grappling with. Um, the MDGs, I think, have been enormously successful. People are wondering, so what's next? Is um, my other Scottish colleague, Lily, suggested. Um, but what should students be doing? What career advice would you have for them? And, and I'm sure Dean Frank has some opinions on this as well. But I'd like to just ask you, for the, on behalf of the students, what you think they should be doing. They hear from me all the time, so I'm keen to, yeah, yeah. to <laughs> hear from uh, Gordon, our guests. You have an idea for the well, students. Don't underestimate your power to help make change possible. I was involved in the last year in a campaign that was built around the attempted assassination of Malala Yousafzai in Pakistan. Uh, and she had been assess uh, attempted, her life had been uh, subject to an attempted assassination because she was trying to get girls to go to school. As a result of what happened, we managed to get 4 million people worldwide to sign a petition, which presented to the Pakistan government of the United Nations. Pakistan then agreed that they would introduce for the first time a commitment to universal education, 3 million scholarships, double expenditure on education. Of course, we've got to make sure that that happens and it's uh, an issue about uh, implementation as well as uh, principle. But don't underestimate the extent to which a few people can make a difference. And uh, when I talk to companies in, say, Africa, if a 100 people uh, campaign by texting them to complain about practices of child labour, they get worried. Uh, and you may think that the things that you do when you become aware of something that's wrong may not make a huge amount of difference, uh, but don't underestimate uh, the power to both persuade companies and governments and international organizations that if you can come together using the social media and the social networks, you can do something quite uh, big. One example I just give you is child marriage free zones make a huge difference to health, make a huge difference to education. Pioneered in Bangladesh, uh, young girls coming together in schools to say that they will not allow them and their fellow school children to be married off against their will. Becoming successful in Bangladesh, but an example of how we learn from each other. Malawi now wants to encourage them. Ethiopia now wants to encourage them. And we should be helping some of these uh, innovative uh, advances where young people are getting together to try to ensure that their rights to health and their rights to education are properly protected. So as uh, students and as postgraduates, uh, I think uh, your awareness of things that are wrong can help you actually make a huge difference in the, in, in the uh, in immediate issues that confront us, as well as taking the long-term view, which is equally important. If I could just add to that, don't feel bound by the way you're educated. So the silos that exist in global health and development exist in every academic institution. So you get trained and taught in this discipline and you don't see the other disciplines or think about the other disciplines. You're not taught to, you're thinking about them. And don't feel bound by that. Do what is necessary, which is reach across, learn multiple issues, learn about development, and how the things fit together. Uh, I was talking with one of your colleagues, Corey, a student here, and he said that what he wants to do is not focus on one disease, but a whole bunch of things and how you make a community better. That's where we should be thinking, where you should be thinking. Julio is thinking of a way to structure ed, uh, education in that new way. But our education system is built in the same siloed way that our goals are. Not surprisingly, that's how they got created. The people who were educated that way <laughs> came forward with that as the solution. So break all those molds open and create a world that's different based on a new vision. Well, I, um, I can see we're going to change uh, education at the Harvard School of Public Health. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to just pick up before we leave. We've had all these great ideas, but I don't want us to just stop and have another conference in a year and nothing is done. What has to happen after we end to, in a sense, get this global vision going? Let me start with you, Gordon. Well, um, 
it, it's great to be part of a, a university seminar, by the way, because uh, I was brought up to believe uh, as a university lecturer in my first uh, uh, life that universities stand for integrity and objectivity and impartiality and rationality. And then I found that these were all the qualities I had to leave behind when I went into politics. <laughs> I, I think the best um, thing that could come out of this um, uh, very important seminar, and I do, I do applaud uh, the organisers as well as the audience, is that we give some strength to the idea that Julio and uh, Mark are putting forward a uh, Bretton Woods for, for health. Uh, how that can be created requires governments to do things, but the pressure to create it can come from people who are concerned that we're not making the best use of resources. So in addition to this year's work, which must include focusing on the Millennium Development Goals as they develop, I think we should give real consideration to how we can bring people together. I would say you start with a conference where you bring together all the potential uh, leaders in this, uh, this field, including the private sector and foundations, and then you debate uh, whether the coordination of the health uh, policy uh, network globally can be better achieved by institutional reform. And whether Harvard does that or whether Mark does that at the Global Fund or whether there are other ways we can do that, I think it is really an idea whose time has come. And I am delighted, therefore, to be part of a seminar that involves the two authors of the proposal. Mark, you know, any... I'll, I'll leave the last word to, to Mark. Um, I would just completely agree with what uh, Gordon Brown has said. And I, I, I do think we're at a critical juncture. We are about to reach the deadline of the 2015. There's a very energized discussion about the future. And I think if we stop for a minute and think, first of all, about people, and we focus the discussion around people, people are, especially those people that are left behind systematically, uh, people are women and children and girls, and we take into account their entire set of needs and develop goals with that perspective, thinking about individuals and populations and the communities of which they are part, rather than the siloed approach. And then we build a new uh, governance uh, set of mechanisms to make sure that we truly, truly understand that we are in a world of interdependence. We move from dependence that was you know, the old traditional colonial ways that um, uh, Mark talked about. We move into independence. That was the technical cooperation mantra of the last century. We need to embrace interdependence. And interdependence means to assume that we are part of a global society with mutual responsibilities for each other and mutual obligations as part of this interdependent world. And that requires, to me, to focus beyond the silos and on people. And Mark, we're leaving this to you to, uh, to, to inspire us for the next phase. I, I don't want to do anything more than agree with what uh, Gordon and Julio said. You know, the worst thing, we used to joke that if the outcome of a meeting is another meeting or a conference, you failed miserably. <laughs> but Gordon's right. We have to bring people together to sit down, just like what happened after World War II around Bretton Woods when the world was falling mm -hmm. apart. And, Seeing that we couldn't get to where we needed to go mm -hmm. with what we had, we're at that point. We are not going to get where we need to go with the way we're currently structured and the way we're doing things, the current way we're thinking about things. So you don't get over that by you know, just accidentally hoping it happens. You actually have to push for it, which means the thinking behind it, the writing of it, the putting it together, and the pressure on people to get together, sit down and say, this isn't working. Uh, and this is what we need to do to fix it. And it's very, it's, it, it, it's going to happen if you all want it to happen. I mean, you're the generation that's gonna make this happen. Put the pressure on the people who are making the decisions now to get it done. Uh, it really is no longer a question of can we do it, the question is will we do it? And it's not gonna happen if people don't get up and say, we need to do it. I would say, must we do it? We must. Thank you so much. We are at the end of the forum. You can continue the conversation online. And I invite you to come to the forum on December 4th, which will be about health care. And I appreciate that you're all here and uh, joining the revolution to make global health a vision for the future. Thank you.